Hello everyone and welcome to our show. Today we discuss about digital marketing process, how you can find your right strategy, get sales, traffic. And I'm excited to discuss this topic with Stefan Spencer. How are you? <laughs> Doing great. Good to be here. Yeah, I love your podcast. You know, you share a lot of valuable insights. Uh, I can't find time to listen to all your episodes, but when I find something new uh, on my uh, iTunes, I can listen to that. So love your stuff. Uh, before we start, just tell more about your experience, background, and why you uh, decided to pay a lot of attention with SEO. Okay, sure. So I've been doing SEO since the 90s. I dropped out of a PhD in biochemistry in 1995 to start an internet company and um, <clears throat> that was uh, uh, all about SEO from probably almost the beginning. We started building websites and realized that we needed to rank highly in search engines and Google didn't exist back in, the, in, in that time. So we had to reverse engineer search engines like InfoSeq and and web crawler and Alta Vista and so forth. And I just, I love reverse engineering stuff. I love uh, tinkering and, and figuring stuff out. So yeah, just once Google came on the scene, I wanted to reverse engineer that and became really specialized in that. And then the first edition of the Art of SEO came out in 2009. And now it's in its third edition, soon to be in its fourth edition. Soon, soon as in like within the next six months or so uh we'll have that out hopefully so yeah it's mm -hmm. been uh it's been quite a journey in in between there i got this crazy idea to move to new zealand uh, from the states so i did that for almost eight years and uh, lived in israel for almost a year uh in the middle of the pandemic currently residing in florida and miami Mm -hmm. Love it, love it. Yeah, why not? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I, by the way, I relocated from Ukraine because of the war, you know, yeah, two months ago. So that was hard experience, but uh, I'm looking for new opportunities uh, in Florida, in the US. So yeah, but, uh, uh, you know, we discussed a few times with my wife where we want to live. We don't know exactly because it's hard to get back to Ukraine, but yeah, it's life. Okay. Uh, uh, I found today that you wrote the book uh, with uh, Eric Ainge, Art of SEO. Can you tell why Art of SEO? Because, you know, uh, uh, many of masters proclaimed uh, that, you know, SEO uh, is boring. Can you tell it's art or boring stuff? <laughs> uh, well, it's art and science. It's mm -hmm. uh, tactics and strategy. Because if you only look at one aspect of it, let's say it's just the science of it, the geeky aspects of things like, um, I don't know, let's, let's say href lang tags or something like that, making sure you get you know, the mm -hmm. uh, return tags all set up properly and everything. You're missing out on the bigger picture. And there's also art in, in SEO in terms of figuring out what, you're trying to accomplish and how to uh, how to creatively solve problems how to mm -hmm. build links in a way that is worthy of of uh, google and not just trying to get around uh, google's algorithms and fly under the radar and mm -hmm. and strategy i love this quote from the art of war by sun tzu it's it's tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat so if mm -hmm. you are working on all the tactical stuff and you miss the strategy you will get leapfrogged by your competitors eventually you need to mm -hmm. leapfrog them by thinking strategically what would be one campaign that would just blow it out of the water for you or your client and execute on that tactics are, are are helpful you know don't get me wrong I, I love tactical stuff i love figuring things out using tools and um and just kind of as i said earlier reverse engineering but if you aren't thinking strategically you, you you'll get put out of business mm -hmm. love it love it uh 
Can you tell how to find the right strategy for uh, SEO project? Because, you know, uh, I often see when uh, webmasters are chasing high volume, they don't consider uh, some uh, metrics. For example, we have a sponsor today, Ahrefs, uh, and uh, I check out some metrics like word difficulty, uh, many other. Uh, and um, uh, can you tell how to find the right strategy? Because uh, most uh, websites can't get organic reach. Uh, if I remember correctly, like 95% of all websites, according to Ahrefs. And... Uh, And uh, I remember another study that only 36% of all websites have a documented content strategy. That means most of websites just uh, don't know where to go, which type of traffic can get, as you mentioned before, that uh, it's uh, the way to nowhere. Can you tell about uh, finding the right strategy? Well, it really depends on, on the client, the company, or, and what they're trying to accomplish. So a strategy isn't a one size fits all sort of thing. If um, let's say it's a it's a nonprofit and and that nonprofit isn't doing anything that remarkable compared to umpteen other nonprofits that are serving that market that are um, I don't know building wells and schools and uh, rural parts of Africa and that doesn't sound that different from another competitor uh, uh, nonprofit not that you know competition I, I think competition is uh, it doesn't truly exist it's it's more of an illusion than re than reality but if you are not differentiating yourself you're not giving people a reason to donate to your nonprofit so I would suggest coming up with some differentiation strategy something that makes you more remarkable from all the other nonprofits that serve that market or that serve uh, that, uh, that region. And maybe it's a, a particular uh, type of campaign you put together. Maybe it's a, a spokesperson that you uh, recruit, like a famous celebrity. Maybe it is a, um, some sort of contest or competition that you run that, you know, like the uh, ice bucket challenge sort of thing, something that differentiates you, makes you worthy of remark. That's the definition of remarkable according to Seth Goat. So mm -hmm. that would be a great strategy. But let's say that uh, a, a different website or, or organization has millions of pages, maybe tens of millions of pages, all dynamic, database driven, and they're not getting enough of their pages indexed in, in the search engines and Google particularly and, and not ranking consequently because you know it's a funnel right at the top of the funnel you get discovered by googlebot and the next stage of the funnel you actually get crawled by googlebot the next stage of the funnel you get uh indexed so you're in google's distributed database the next uh stage in the funnel after that is actually getting uh rankings after getting rankings then you get clicks not everything that ranks gets clicks right because it might not look compelling mm -hmm. terrible Uh, snippet in, or, or uh, title. And then once you get the clicks, get the visitors, now you actually have to convert them. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. a lot of steps. There's a lot of leakage points in that funnel. So if you think in terms of what are you going to do in that scenario where you've got tens of millions of pages, many of them not getting indexed in Google, it might be a content pruning issue. It might be that you've submitted a lot of URLs in the XML sitemaps that are uh, not canonical or that are 404 errors or uh, redirects and things like that that are not supposed to be in an XML sitemap. Maybe it's that uh, these pages look like thin content. There's not enough uh, copy on these pages or they look too similar to each other, right? So that strategy then is around content pruning potentially and or uh, differentiating the content, uh, the, the pages from each other so they look unique and valuable. Completely mm -hmm. different strategy. So it very much depends on who we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, love it. Uh, can you tell, uh, you know, uh, from my experience, for example, I have big clients, uh, companies that uh, earn millions. And, you know, uh, I found one way uh, they can't create... Uh, 
high quality content. It's no, uh, no, not content to write high quality text. And they usually reply to me, you know, uh, we have no time uh, to uh, write text. We usually spend time to compete in uh, with our competitors. We need to develop innovate our products. But when we need to write, we have no experience with that. Can you help me? And, you know, uh, I know, for example, if you uh, hire copywriters online, most of them just rewrite existing content into top 10 results. Can you tell how to help such companies uh, to find the right copywriter uh, who know the topic because we have the, the parameter EAT, like expertise, authority, trust, and copywriters need to understand the topic or spend time to research more, to provide some new valuable insights. And uh, it's not about rewriting content. For example, if you check out on some tools, you can find get uh, 100%. But it's not about that. It's more about sharing something new, uh, valuable stuff. Can you tell how to find the right copywriters? Yeah, yeah, we, we do this. We have a content team uh, we've developed, and, and we use uh, uh, resources like ProBlogger uh, job boards and uh, LinkedIn uh, job postings and um, uh, very, uh, very different resources, uh, which I can get into. Uh, if, if you'd like, but first off, you need to differentiate the writer from the curator, because mm -hmm. if you're going to write remarkable content worthy of remark, you're going to have to write stuff that is well curated. For example, maybe they're going to have to find great examples of uh, movie clips to incorporate into a, a blog post or uh, great examples of of um, viral memes uh, in relation to a particular topic. So that's curation. That's not writing. Mm -hmm. What we found is if we get, uh, if we put together a solid brief, which includes the topic, then the hook, right? That angle that makes it uh, link worthy and, and, and uh, click worthy, grabs them, brings the visitor, the, the reader in, and then from there, we go to the title, the headline of the article or content piece, right? Which might have some provocative adjectives or adverbs in it, as well as the hook. Then from there, we've identified uh, some key bullet points and, and maybe some uh, uh, viral memes or funny um, uh, clips from videos and, and things to incorporate right? That's the curation part of it. You hand that to a writer, you will get a much better outcome than if you just say, hey, mm -hmm. write an article about this topic, right? Garbage in, mm -hmm. garbage out. So if you put fantastic um, briefs together, hand those to your writers, you'll get a much better outcome. But where do you find those fantastic writers? You can find them on, on uh, so many different places. We've hired fantastic writers just from Craigslist. So we pick a city, mm -hmm that is uh, more of a college town, but a larger city. You know, so Madison, Wisconsin is a college town, but it's too small. So we would mm -hmm. uh, opt for something like Boston or um, New York City, just as examples. And then we would post job ads there and we would put specific um, uh nuances into the job ad where if they don't follow those instructions they're out they're not even uh, considered they're not even replied to right you have to put a certain thing in the subject line you need to leave a voicemail instead of an email or you need to uh, solve this uh, problem solving riddle right there's a um, a cop and a and a child and a, and a convict on one side of the river and there's a boat to get them across to the other side of the river, but it only seats two people and can't leave the child alone or with the convict and blah, blah, blah. So get them all across the river. We actually put that sort of stuff into our job adverts and the people who take the time and, and put the thought into the reply and follow our instructions end up being fantastic candidates. And maybe that, cuts out 90% of the candidates that we'd normally get, but it's totally worth it, right? Signal to noise. So it's just uh, a, a process of vetting, of uh, identifying your needs, of course, before that, and also being clear on the job description, which not 
just explains what the job is, but you've identified the roles, the responsibilities, which are different from roles. So you might have three job roles and you might have 15 job responsibilities. And then you have your success metrics. How is this person going to be measured against their, um, uh, their output versus their output? And then finally, what are the handoffs? Where does that person's job end and the next person's job begin? Is this person expected to, um, I don't know, find uh, the, the funny uh, viral memes as well? That's more curation. If you try and get somebody to do the curation as part of the writing job, you better find somebody who really gets the, the kind of virality of the internet and, and mm -hmm. knows to go like to board panda distractify viral nova upworthy uh you know buzzfeed etc and understands what the memes are that are funny and and which ones are inappropriate and you know on brand versus off brand that's a lot that's a lot so be very clear in what you need and then once you've delineated all that then you go to the different sources we've used recruiters like if we're hiring for a person in in the philippines for example we prefer to use virtual staff finder which is a headhunting firm a recruiter rather than posting to onlinejobs.ph you can find great candidates and uh, spend less uh, on onlinejobs.ph but it's worth the extra 500 bucks to use a recruiter and have them bring you the finalists that they have background checked and tested and interviewed. And now you, you're getting the finalists. We've had fantastic success uh, with uh, virtual staff finder. It's like 600 bucks. It's a no brainer. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Uh, you mentioned about the right instructor is instructions. Can you tell how to create the right instructions? Uh, because, you know, uh, for example, I usually uh, cooperate with copywriters and, uh, you know, like we have some obsolete techniques to submit 5% of these keywords to the text or uh, uh, to write like 2,000 or 3,000 words. What do you think, uh, how to create uh, modern right instructions uh, to lead copywriters in the right direction? Because, uh, you know, like uh, it's not about keyword density or uh, the number of symbols. It's more about the quality of the job. And most copywriters, if they know the topic, uh, you know, uh, how to tell them you don't need to limit your possibilities if you can share more value with that. Uh, yeah, just share more insights about creating instructions for copywriters. Yeah, well, I find that it's more important to train them and to get um, <clears throat> get them up to speed with the right tools and the right um, way of thinking rather than give them uh, granular instructions on uh, word count or uh, the uh, average like age of the, the the reader or that sort of thing. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, those can be helpful, those little uh, uh, data points, but it's much more important to have them get the ethos of our company and how uh, what it means to be remarkable and to write content that's remarkable and to cover a topic in a comprehensive way rather than stuffing keywords, right? So if you're familiar with the concept of LSI keywords, latent semantic indexing is not yeah. an algorithm that Google's using, but the concept is valuable. And that is these are related keywords that are close in, in, in this, it's in the same topic space, right? So if you're going to write an article about lawnmowers, and you don't ever talk about yard, grass, clippings, uh, landscaping, uh, weed whacker, horsepower, riding versus uh, uh, you know, push lawnmowers, et cetera. Like you're not covering any of those uh, related LSI keywords. You are creating a very surface level, uh, thin content piece. It might have 2,000 mm -hmm. words, but it's still thin content because it's not going into the topic in any real depth. And the algorithms at Google are so much more sophisticated than we give them credit for. So it's not about keyword density, as you said. It's not even about 
uh, the word count and about uh, things like, you know, did, did we cover all these different subtopics in there? It's really about how comprehensive and valuable is this content piece? Because if an expert in that topic space can read the article and determine uh, very quickly whether that article gets an A or an F or somewhere in between, an algorithm at Google is actually better than that, right? It's mm -hmm. better than the expert. These are called expert system AIs and uh, Google certainly has them. So if we uh, can't pass muster in, in terms of the quality of the article and, and the utility of it, remember there are multiple kinds of hooks. So you can have a utility hook, you could have a newsworthy hook, a controversy hook, a humor hook, uh, original research hook. There are lots of ways that you can differentiate that content piece. It's not on word count. It's not even just on the depth of the content and, and, and how much coverage of the topic you provide. It's the remarkability of it. And it's the way that you convey it in a, in a novel uh, approach that makes it so much better than all the other content out there. You know, I'm sure you've heard the term skyscraper content. Right, the skyscraper piece. It's it stands above and uh, beyond every other piece of content on that topic. It deserves links. It deserves mm -hmm. shares and retweets. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, skyscraper technique is popular technique from Brian Dean, and yeah. um, I love the strategy. When I create my content plan, I usually check out topics that have a lack of quality content. Uh, so, uh, for example, if uh, you uh, analyze some keywords and can see a lot of other high quality content, uh, you need to understand it's hard to overcome them because uh, Google uh, has a lot of choices. So it's better to find uh, outdated information or lack of quality content where you can create uh, much better content. So, and it's better to jump on this field with that. Yeah, but here's here's the challenge is that a lot of companies, a lot of uh, clients that you'll you'll get won't understand what it means to write for the linkerati, for the influencer mm -hmm. Google considers to be high authority, high trust websites. And thus, all the stuff that will be produced is specific to the core client avatar, right? The ideal client avatar who probably doesn't have an authoritative website, <clears throat> right? So if you're, <clears throat> if you're, um, writing content for law firms because that's your clientele and most law firms don't have very authoritative websites you're missing the mark you should be writing for the linkerati or at least a portion of what you write should be for the linkerati and it may not appeal to a single law firm owner or uh, or, or a partner in the law mm -hmm. firm and that's okay because you're, you're creating content that's worthy of people linking to you and the people who are linking to you that have been targeted with that content piece have high authority, right? It's the, mm -hmm. it's the 80, 20 rule. It's the Pareto principle. So if you target the 20% that will give you 80% of the value in, in your efforts, that's worthy mm -hmm. of your time. And you can actually get to another level on that because the Pareto principle, 80-20 rules is, is actually fractal. So there's an 80-20 of the 80-20. And then there's an 80-20 of the 80-20 of the 80-20, meaning that 5% mm -hmm. of the uh, efforts and, and, and the content that you produce will generate 54 or 56% of the value so find that five percent and focus on that and again this is not something that you can just write into an assignment and say here's your brief the person needs to get that ethos they need to be uh on board with that kind of thinking right let me find the five percent that gets the 54 percent in this content piece or in for this project or in this campaign it's a different way mm -hmm. of thinking and it's not standard. And most people that you will bring on board will need to be trained on that. So that's where the onboarding and training process is critical. Right? We have so many videos. I have um, public courses, online courses on my site that will 
teach people things like remarkable remarkability in, in your content marketing and your link building and how to uh, write conversion focused content and all the sort of stuff that's on my website as uh, paid courses. But we also give that content and more to our internal team to get mm -hmm. up speed and on the latest, uh, uh, latest, greatest techniques and, and ways of thinking. Yeah, love it, love it. And uh, yeah, you said about uh, to train people uh, in the right way. Uh, let's, uh, you know, change approach to find the right people uh, as your specialist to your team. For, because, you know, I remember once I've listened to one episode when you shared your insights to ask some uh, uh, questions, you know, like uh, questions about uh, uh, do we need to use keywords, uh, meta keywords on the page to check out specialists? Do they know about modern stuff that it doesn't work for many years? I don't know how many years, like 10 years. Um, by the way, I asked this question uh, Fabrice Canel from Bing, and he replied to me on my podcast, uh, Bing doesn't consider meta keywords like 15 years. Google doesn't consider many years. Probably on YouTube, we, we can consider and get some insights from that. Yeah. Can you well, tell I remember how... Matt Cutts saying that uh, Google actually never counted meta keywords, uh -huh. ever. Positively, it was never a signal. Now, they might have used it as a negative signal to uh, help flag for further inspection potential spammers. So if you have mm. a thousand keywords in your meta keyword, that, <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't look so good. But uh, yeah, it was never a positive ranking signal. So what you're referring to is uh, what I call a SEO BS detector. And mm -hmm. I, I have that as a free download on my website, on, on stephanspencer.com, also on our agency website on netconcepts.com. So if you are not that uh, up to speed on SEO and you want to hire an SEO specialist, either as a as an employee or a contractor, you want to make sure you make the right hire, but you don't know the right questions to ask. Ask like you would normally ask the kinds of questions that you ask of, uh, you know, a, a, of any candidate, but then slip into the interview these trick questions where there's only one right answer and I give you what that right answer is. And, you know, don't make it obvious that you're doing this, but it makes it very clear to you whether this person is blowing smoke or not. And I remember interviewing for one of my clients. Uh, this was, you know, it was maybe, I don't know, five years ago or something. Uh, I interviewed this finalist, this candidate who made it through the previous rounds. And they were going to be the head of SEO at this company. And when I interviewed the guy, I asked him about his favorite SEO tools. Very innocent. You know, just like, you know, tell me what your favorite SEO tools are. And, and he mentioned majestic seo and my spidey sense went like because <laughs> it was no longer called majestic seo is majestic yeah so then i asked him well what's your favorite metric in majestic right because uh -huh. i knew this leading question would probably uh you know turn him in <laughs> as a poser uh -huh. and sure enough <laughs> Uh, he, he mentioned AC rank, uh, which didn't exist anymore. That had been deprecated years earlier and replaced with trust flow and citation flow. So I quickly wrapped up the interview. I'm sure he didn't realize what was going on, but I, I knew from that point forward, this guy didn't know SEO from a hole in the ground and the information that he was, uh, sharing was very dated and, uh, yeah, it just, mm -hmm was very clear that this was not the right person to hire. So that is for somebody who's pretty versed on SDO and I could ask that on the fly. What if you don't have that kind of knowledge base? Well, that's where that SEO BS detector comes in. You know, like what, what's your process for optimizing meta keywords? There's only one right answer. It's like, are mm -hmm. you serious? Meta keywords, those never <laughs> counted in Google. That's the only right answer. If they're giving you mm -hmm. some sort of nonsense around it not being as important uh or that uh mm -hmm. you know they they don't really do much with it these days or what, like there's an only one right answer so mm -hmm. if you can just work that into the interview process you're going to be in much better shape there are other questions around kind of values and um and priorities and getting specific like people do not get specific enough in their hiring process and in the interview specifically 
asking about examples where, um, let, let's say that they said their biggest weakness, I hate this question, by the way, it's always uh, a, a thinly veiled strength that they think they're being clever. You know, tell me an example of a weakness. And then they're like, well, I kind of am, uh, I don't know, a perfectionist. <laughs> I like <laughs> things to be well done and right and whatever. Like, first of all, that's BS because they're just trying to make it sound like it's an, it's a strength, but answering the question is if it's a weakness and, and actually it is a terrible weakness because the person who is a perfectionist has no standards because nothing ever gets done because there's no place where they're like, all right, this is good to go, ready to publish, mm -hmm. which is the same as not having any standards at all. It's just, yeah, yeah it's a terrible weakness. Now, um, anyway, so what if you asked a specific question around, tell me a time and a, a situation where your biggest strength that you just shared with me became the asset that saved the project or that turned the project around or that made it a huge success, much more so than it would have been otherwise. And then you just sit back and you listen to the answer. I always mm -hmm. ask for specifics, but here's where you can get into um, tapping into their values. You can actually, before the interview process, do a, a Demartini values hierarchy uh, process with them. Just send them the link to the Dr. Demartini website to the place where they can fill out the hierarchy of values. Like these, this is my top value. This is my second, third, and fourth, etc. And you got to make sure that your job uh, description, the the duties and the responsibilities match up really well with those top um, values. But in any event, if you're in the process of interviewing the person, you ask simple. You know, just kind of uh, uh, just off the cuff question, but it's not off the mm -hmm. cuff. You say, well, you know, of these various attributes, I'm just going to rattle off. Which one do you think is the most important for this job? Attention to detail. Um, mm -hmm. You know, let's say um, creativity, technical acumen, dedication, honesty. Like, What would be the best, uh, most important? And you just <laughs> wait for them to answer it. And they're probably going to try and answer it in the way that they think gets them the most you know, points with you, which is the wrong answer. The only right answer is honesty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is the honesty okay. test. I learned this from my, my friend Sam. Uh, and and it, I, it comes in so handy because you cannot train into somebody honesty. If that's not one of their values you're, you're, you're going to end up in a world of hurt eventually, right? Who, who wants to have somebody that, um, you know, the second that you come by the, the like in an office environment, you, I remember having a, a staff person like this, I could see through the reflection on the, the window behind her that she would be zipping up windows as I'm walking up to her. And it was almost every time. And, but I could see what she was doing. She didn't know it, but I could see that she was on Facebook, that she was doing stupid stuff, just messing around, mm -hmm. not working on the projects that she was supposed to be working on. I could see it. You don't want that. You want somebody who's honest and, and the attention to detail and stuff like that is not necessary for every single role. If you're looking for somebody who's a creative, attention to detail is not important. If you're mm -hmm. looking for somebody who's a, like a, a deal maker, puts uh, big deals together, partnerships, strategic alliances, they don't need to be attentive to all the details. You have somebody who's their, their assistant or their, uh, their, a, a direct report to them yeah, that, hand, that will handle the details for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, love, love it, love it. Yeah, so valuable. Yeah, I agree with, with that completely. I think, you know, for example, uh, digital marketing is huge. And when uh, you cooperate 
with uh, customers uh, when they ask me, can you help me with Instagram or any, even uh, with some specific link building techniques. If I'm not good with, with that, I can reply. Sorry, guys, I can help. You know, it's not my uh, strong side. I can understand the process, but I'm not good with Pinterest, uh, Instagram or specific link building techniques because, yeah, SEO is huge as well. It's better to uh, choose priorities. I know some uh, specialists who provide only one link building technique uh, to earn a million dollars. You know, uh, good money because they pay attention to one specific technique. If you ask them, please help to create content, they reply to you, no way. Uh, we don't do it. Uh, they deny uh, because uh, they know uh, they are good with something. And uh, it's better to be the best in one side than uh, trying to cover everything like jack of all trades, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's not yeah. Well, this reminds me of a concept I learned from Jay Abraham, who is one of the greatest marketers mm -hmm. of our time. Uh, he refers to it as the principle of preeminence. If your prospect or your client is better served by being sent away to your competitor, you should do that, right? It's like business mm -hmm. karma. It, you will get bitten. You will end up being uh handed your hat eventually if you're doing stuff that you're not the best at and the client doesn't get the best results put yourself in the client's shoes and make sure that you're serving them the best and sometimes serving them the best is saying you know what we're not the best for you i can refer you to somebody else and it doesn't have to be somebody that gives you a kickback <laughs> right just be <laughs> the person or the uh, agency or contractor that will deliver the best results for the client and uh, that's yeah. just the, the right way to be in the world right because it's not a zero-sum game this is not about competition and um my my loss is your gain and vice versa it's it's so much richer than that this uh, this amazing universe we live in is friendly and it's uh it's based on love and so many people are still based in fear uh, so you know, everything that we do could be um, either fear-based or, or love-based. I prefer, I prefer love. So in, in terms of let's get specific to what, I don't know, let's say Pinterest or, or Instagram or something like that. If, if your company doesn't offer that or isn't that good at it, make it uh, one of your missions to find the resource that is amazing at it. Right. So if somebody needs LinkedIn ads, I don't do that. My team doesn't do that, but we can refer them to AJ Wilcox. Or uh, if um, if it's Pinterest, you know, we've got uh, a contractor we use from time to time who's a Pinterest power user. And, and so we'll pull her in. Or if it's TikTok, well, I don't even have a TikTok currently. And, and I understand virality. So I could provide some input on the strategy of it, but I'm not a TikTok expert. So uh, there's a lady named Mayan Gordon who has over a billion views on TikTok. And so I refer uh, clients to her and then she can provide a strategy and uh, a bunch of examples and, and audit the client's TikTok channel if they're already on, on TikTok. Yeah, yeah. AJ Wilcox uh, spoke on my podcast and he handles uh, campaigns like 120 million dollars uh, on LinkedIn. No, yeah, it's a lot. And uh, yeah, and uh, 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 you mentioned about the second expert. Uh, she spoke on my podcast, on my event. Yeah, love, love her insights. Valuable. I think, uh, yeah. Uh, and they are different for LinkedIn. You need to uh, to set up the right uh, data, the right message, you can overcome competitors because cost per click is uh, crazy, you know, <laughs> compared to other social media or even Google ads. Uh, on TikTok, you need to be consistent uh, to create content, but uh, these people can create valuable campaigns. They can, they know how to set up the right message uh, to cover your target audience. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, I have the question about the future of SEO. What kind of future can you predict today? And uh, do we need to consider SEO today when, uh, for example, if you start from scratch, if you uh, have no any metrics, uh, a newly registered website, and uh, when you have such competition, uh, what do you think about uh, setting SEO today? Okay, 
Well, there's a great quote I, I heard at uh, Abundance 360 from Peter Diamandis. It's a mastermind that uh, is all about future and uh, future technologies and uh, yeah, AI, nanotechnology, space exploration. Oh, yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing mastermind. So anyways, Peter Diamandis said that there are going to be two kinds of businesses by the end of this decade. Businesses that use AI at their core and businesses that are out of business. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a little provocative, right? But it's, I believe to be true. It's, um, you know, prognosticating and, 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 uh, um, you know, kind of fortune telling or future telling, but it, I think it is going to turn out to be accurate that you need to have AI at the core of your business. So what does that mean for, for an SEO specialist, well, there there are some AI based tools out there. You know, like Market Muse, for example, is known as having a lot of AI in its technology. But if you're not just using AI, but you're incorporating it into how you do your job, I think that is something that will help future proof your career and your business. And best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. So I would start today. If you <laughs> haven't done this already, start now. Start playing around with, like, learn a bit, a little, a little uh, on, on Python. Start uh, using some of the different um, tools. Get, a, uh, get, get access to GPT-3 from OpenAI and, and start feeding it data and, and, and instructions and see what you can get back from it. Because you know, it's not about just using AI to write content for you or using AI to analyze the uh, page quality or other metrics of, of your website. It's, it's about putting AI into the core of your business and using that as a differentiator. So that's, I think, the future of SEO. If, uh, if you think about how do you outsmart an AI which Google is full of AI, right? And, and they, they own DeepMind. They acquired that company last decade. Uh, they are just so AI focused. How do you outsmart an AI, especially one as smart as Google's? Mm -hmm. with, yeah, another, yeah. with another AI. So that's the only way to outsmart an AI, and as far as I'm concerned. So if you don't have AIs at your disposal, then you're 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 gonna have a hard time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm using AI even today, uh, and I'm going to uh, to set up AI to my tool. Uh, by the way, to create content with AI, because from my experience, for example, I can write like two thousand words a day uh, if I know the topic. But uh, if I uh, if I'm using AI, I can write like uh, 20,000 words a day to edit manually uh, all getting text because sometimes you can get some nonsense, sometimes you can get good stuff and you need to add additional insights just to spend time. And yeah, yeah. we have the goal to unite GPT-3 with our tool. And yeah, I, I spoke with Jeff Cole uh, from Market News. He shares a lot of insights about that. So yeah, uh, I'm excited to learn more about AI to unite. Because, give you yeah, I think example, because you're efficient. talking about writing content. And what if mm -hmm. you had an existing uh, whole stable of articles already written, but you don't have any videos yet? Well, you can use an AI in the form of Lumen5. L-U-M-E-N, the number five dot com, and feed it these different articles that you already have published. And it will create a draft video for each one. It will analyze the page copy of each article, pull out the key concepts, the, the, the biggest uh, kind of bullet points. Even if it's a long form article and it doesn't have bullet points, it will create mm -hmm. them in, using the AI. And then it will figure out uh, how to set it up in terms of a set of slides and then what music to have playing in the background and what um, effects to utilize to bring in the text and then uh, what sort of um, videos and, and uh, still images to have in the background. 
because it's got a huge stock video and, and stock image library. Now you have a draft social media video to share. Uh, you know, I don't probably need tweaking, but you, you're 80% of the way there. Now it's just tweaking and, and uh, revising rather than starting from scratch. You don't have to mm -hmm. be an, a, a skilled video editor. You just go into their interface and tweak some of the bullets and what the, if you don't like the music that they chose, pick a different track and, you know, other kinds of, uh, effects and if the bullet uh, text is too long and shorten it or whatever. Like you just tweak it it's so much mm -hmm. more efficient. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Stefan. Yeah. It's a big pleasure to get you on my show, to learn from you, to get all this valuable insights, tell our audience how they can reach out to you, learn more about you, follow you. Yeah. So stephanspencer.com is my main website. I have two podcasts. So uh, Anatoly, I hope you listen to my other show. <laughs> well, of course. Yeah, I will. Great. I will. I didn't my know that. Get yourself optimized, which is not a SEO podcast. It's a biohacking, personal development, and spirituality mm. podcast. That is yeah. my real passion. So definitely check that show out. That's at getyourselfoptimized.com. The marketing podcast is marketingspeak.com. I've been doing both shows since 2015. So they're uh, there's 700 hours of content there <laughs> it's a, and it's nice. amazing content well worth your time uh mm -hmm. and and then of course there's the agency website netconcepts.com and we do of course seo but we also do um other things related to things like social media content creation conversion optimization and so forth uh web strategy and my socials on twitter i'm s spencer uh, Instagram, Stefan Spencer, uh, yeah, Pinterest, Stefan Spencer, LinkedIn, Stefan Spencer. Yep. So follow me on socials and reach out if you're um, interested, not just in working together, but if you're just uh, curious about something, maybe you listen to one of my podcast episodes. I, I love it when people contact me. I'm, um, I'm not in some ivory tower. I, yeah, I, I love giving back or, or, you know, I, that's not the best term for it, but I love sharing and, and uh, giving and being uh, part of this, uh, this amazing community. Love it. Love it. Yeah, I definitely will do because, you know, uh, self-improvement is my second way where I, I learn a lot more because I change a lot of my bad habits like uh, the last, in the last three years uh, because uh, I got flu uh, in 2019. Probably that was the first uh, COVID-19 uh, and I could recover for 45 days. And after that, I changed a lot of bad habits and completely forget about any flu, cold, any other stuff because I can take cold shower every day. I can eat healthy food uh, to spend more time with uh, exercises. Yeah, so self-improvement is my uh, second passion as well. <laughs> so I, guys, you need to listen. Uh, Stefan Spencer, the second podcast. I didn't know about that. So yeah, excited to know more about that. <laughs> okay, uh, guys, you can find all these links to Stefan Spencer uh, in the description below. Listen to us on Apple, Google, Spotify, and see you next time.